Hello and welcome to another teaching by 119 Ministries. Our ministry teaches that the whole Bible is true and applicable for our lives today. If you would like to know more about what we believe and teach, please visit us at testeverything.net. We hope that you enjoy studying and testing the following teaching. Quite often we receive questions asking about the Moedim, Yahweh's holy days. What are the Moedim, and what is their point? While there are many opinions held concerning the holy days, we want to do our best in giving a general overview of them. We simply want to help give a better understanding to these important days in the eyes of Yahweh. Many have looked at these days as just for the Jews. However, we know that the Jews do not represent all 12 tribes. In addition, we also know the commandments surrounding the Holy Days are given to all who choose to follow Yahweh, regardless of whether they are native-born Israelite or grafted in through the faith. Numbers 15, 15 through 16. The community is to have the same rules for you and the alien living among you. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. You and the alien shall be the same before Yahweh. The same laws and regulations will apply to you and to the alien living among you. Because many do not understand that Yahweh gave his holy days to all in the faith, many in mainstream Christianity today do not keep the Moedim festivals. Sadly, the same people also do not understand that the substance of these holy days are all about teaching us about the Messiah. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 17. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in the questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival, or a new moon, or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. This teaching in particular will teach how to observe Sukkot and some of the exciting messianic prophecies attached to this feast. In review, there are eight Moedim, or appointed times. The first of the Moedim is the Sabbath, in which a rest occurs every seven days. The rest of the Moedim are annual observations, which are Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Shavuot, or Pentecost, Yom Teruah, or the Day of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, and Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. Three of these Moedim are specifically called feasts, meaning they are moedim that involve feasting. Those are unleavened bread, Shavuot, and Sukkot. Sukkot, also called Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, is the final annual feast and the focus of this teaching. Leviticus 23 verses 33 through 43. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days, is the feast of booths to Yahweh. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to Yahweh. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to Yahweh. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of Yahweh, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to Yahweh food offerings, burnt offerings, and grain offerings, and sacrifices, and drink offerings, each on its proper day, besides Yahweh's Sabbaths, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your freewill offerings, which you give to Yahweh. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of Yahweh seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before Yahweh your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to Yahweh for seven days in the year." is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, 
I am Yahweh your God. From this, we learn that Sukkot begins on the 15th day of the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. It lasts for seven days, and then there's a bonus day called the eighth day. Both the first and eighth day are considered rest days. So this is the seventh annual Moedim, occurring for seven days in the seventh month. The extra eighth day is sometimes referred to as the last great day. This day is very interesting prophetically, and we will discuss that in the prophecy section of this teaching. During the seven-day period, all native Israelites are instructed to dwell in booths, or temporary dwellings. Sometimes the mention of native-born Israelites in Leviticus 23.42 confuses people, as if all the Moedim are for everyone, except for Sukkot is oddly only for native Israelites. Remember in the faith, all are native Israelites. Many are grafted in and are treated just the same. Even the grafted in are the same as native-born before Yahweh. For more on this, please see our teaching, Grafted In. But to illustrate it here, Numbers chapter 15, 15 through 16. The community is have the same rules for you and for the alien living among you. This is a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. You and the alien shall be the same before Yahweh. The same laws and regulations will apply both to you and the alien living among you. If the mention of native-born Israelites still compels you to believe that Sukkot might not be for all in the faith, we will mention one more point at the end of this teaching. Also, on the first day of this feast, we are to take the fruit of splendid trees, branches of the palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before Yahweh, your God, seven days. Many times these items are attached to a sukkah, which is the singular form of the Hebrew word sukkot. In observation of the feast, not everyone lives in a sukkah for seven days. A traditional sukkah today typically has no roof or shielding from cold weather or rain. While a sukkah works well for a dry, warm climate like Jerusalem, many utilize tents or other temporary dwellings during this time outside of Jerusalem. Deuteronomy's account of Sukkot specifically mentions that we should rejoice or be joyful during this time. Yahweh is literally commanding us to be joyful. Deuteronomy 16. You shall keep the Feast of Booths seven days, when you have gathered in the produce from the threshing floor and your wine press. You shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, and your male servant and your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep the feast to Yahweh your God at the place Yahweh will choose, because Yahweh your God will bless you in your produce and in the work of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful." Three times a year, all your males shall appear before Yahweh your God at the place that he will choose. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks, Shavuot, and the Feast of Booths, Sukkot. They shall not appear before Yahweh empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing at Yahweh your God he has given you. You may have also noticed that this feast, like the other two feasts, are to occur in Jerusalem and involve the temple which is the place that Yahweh put his name. Of course, there exists no temple today, so we cannot come before Yahweh with gifts. As a result, many memorialize this feast by doing it the best that they can, even though it is not possible to go before Yahweh at the temple. And of course, finally, this feast is about feasting, eight days of eating, in fact. At this time in Jerusalem, the harvest was coming to a close. This feast is an agricultural feast, taking advantage of all the food Yahweh has blessed us with during the harvest. This also has a prophetic significance that we will discuss later in the teaching. Sukkot is often the favorite of all the feasts. It's a time of focused fellowship with Yahweh and all those in the faith, celebrating with worship, food, and all sorts of traditions. Sometimes Sukkot is observed in the backyard. Other times, hundreds of families may Sukkot together for one large, amazing event. However you do it, it always proves to be a blessed and joyful time. The Meaning of Sukkot and Prophecy The first time Sukkot is mentioned in Scripture is found in Genesis, Genesis 33. But Jacob journeyed to Sukkot, 
and built himself a house and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the name of the place is called Sukkoth. After bowing seven times in verse 3 and leaving Esau behind in verse 17, Jacob arrives to a place he names Sukkot. The mention of a seven is connected with Sukkot. One of the things that Yahweh mentions as the purpose of Sukkot is to remind us when Israel dwelt in booths after coming out of Egypt. Going back to Leviticus 23. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths. That your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am Yahweh your God. Which is interesting because the first place they stop is at Sukkot, Exodus 12. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. So when we dwell in booths for Sukkot, we are to be reminded of the wilderness when Yahweh took his people out of Egypt and brought them into temporary dwellings in the wilderness. Sukkot is mentioned by our Messiah Yeshua as well. On the last day of the feast, the great day, meaning the eighth day, Yeshua stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Yeshua may have been giving more understanding of Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, 1 through 2. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk, without money and without price. But here is what is rather interesting, specifically on the eighth day. Yeshua mentions living waters. This commands attention to the new Jerusalem. Zechariah 14. And there shall be a unique day which is known to Yahweh, neither day or night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day, living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. In the context of the New Jerusalem, we also read in the Revelation 22, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever." Most believe the new Jerusalem will arrive after Yeshua reigns for 1,000 years. Following the story of creation, there are six days, and the seventh day is the rest. There is a biblical principle that uses the days of creation each day as 1,000 years, meaning there will be 6,000 years of man, and on the seventh day, or the 7,000th year, Yeshua arrives and we rest and reign with him for 1,000 years or one day, specifically the Sabbath day. After the seventh day, technically the eighth day, the new Jerusalem will arrive. For more on this, we would recommend the teaching, the fourth and seventh day, and Hebrews 4 and his rest now or later. Meaning this, it was not likely an accident that Yeshua mentions the living waters on the eighth day of Sukkot, as we are presented with the living waters from the new Jerusalem also on the eighth day. This is why the Feast of Sukkot groups the seven days together and then mentions another eighth day. In addition, the new Jerusalem arrives after the old earth and the old heaven pass away, and we are presented with a new heaven and a new earth. Thus, Sukkot also reminds us that this life and this earth is temporary. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 1, For we know that if the tent, that is, our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It should also be noted that all harvest will have occurred by then. The barley harvest, the wheat harvest, and the grape harvest. That is the purpose of Sukkot, to feast on all the completed harvests. There is a prophetic implication to consider here as well. 
Yeshua is referred to as the first fruits of the harvest, which is the barley harvest. 1 Corinthians 15.20 But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. There is also the wheat harvest, Matthew 13. He, Yeshua, put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servant said to him, Then do you want to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. And 36 through 43. Then he left the crowds and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out in his kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears, let him hear. The grape harvest are the rebellious. Revelation 14. Then another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire, and he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for its grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Sukkot follows the completion of all harvests, and is also a feast of the harvests. Often it is proposed that Sukkot will be the timing of the wedding supper of the Lamb. Revelation 19. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. So the reason that the marriage supper of the Lamb is speculated to be at Sukkot is because all the harvest have been completed, and it is also found as the last and final feast. Another interesting connection is found in the timeline of the first temple dedication, where the temple was dedicated on the eighth day of Sukkot. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 8-10 through 10. So Solomon observed the feast at that time for seven days, and all Israel with him, a very great assembly who came from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt. On the eighth day they held a solemn assembly for the dedication of the altar. They observed seven days and the feast seven days. Then, on the twenty-third day of the seventh month, he sent the people to their tents, rejoicing and happy of heart, because of the goodness that Yahweh has shown to David and to Solomon and to his people Israel. Likewise, this appears similar to the New Jerusalem, in which the temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Revelation 21 
And I saw no temple in the city, New Jerusalem, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. Those are simply the prophetic highlights relating to Sukkot. There exist hours of prophetic depth in the context of Sukkot. We simply wanted to offer you a start on Sukkot prophecy. One last thing to note, after the Great Tribulation ends, the Antichrist is defeated, and we enter into the 1,000 years reigning with Messiah Yeshua, guess what? All nations will be observing Sukkot. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 16. Then everyone who survives of all the nations that have come against Jerusalem shall go up year after year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Booths, Sukkot. This helps prove two things. Number one, the holy days found in Leviticus 23 are not abolished like mainstream Christianity teaches. And number two, it is just not native-born Israelites that are to observe Sukkot. If you do not already observe Sukkot, consider and understand that Yahweh gave us these days for a reason, to teach us about our Messiah, to spend time in worship of Yahweh, to get away from daily life, and instead spend time with our family and those in the faith. We hope that this teaching has blessed you. And remember, continue to test everything. Shalom. It is because of you, our generous supporters, who make it possible to offer these high-quality teachings completely free of charge. If you feel led to support 119 Ministries so that we can continue this effort, please visit testeverything.net and click on the Support 119 tab. Learn how you can partner with us to take the whole Word of God to the nations.